Meditation is both a matter of technique and a matter of values. What we do and why it's worth doing. Like right now, focusing on the breath. As the Buddha says, you're aware of when the breath is long, you discern when it's short. And the word discerning here doesn't mean you simply watch what's already there. The analogy he gives is of a turner, someone who turns wood on a lathe. And the turner knows when he's making a long turn and when he's making a short turn. And he has the choice. He's the one who chooses to make a long turn or a short turn. And that's the same with the breath. You try to notice what kind of breathing feels good right now. Because one of the purposes of this is to give rise to a sense of energy or rapture and also to give us a sense of pleasure. So notice, when you breathe long right now, is it pleasant? If it's not, you can change. Make it shorter, in long, out short, in short, out long. And then from there you can extrapolate heavy, light, fast, slow, deep, shallow. And then as the body gets energized by the breath, then you want to spread your awareness to fill the whole body, because you want that sense of energy to suffuse through the body, along with that sense of pleasure. And then when everything feels nicely energized by the breath, the breath energy in the body feels full, then you can allow the breath to calm down. Those are the basic steps in terms of the breath. One of the interesting features of those steps is the Buddha doesn't say simply, let the breath calm down. He says, calm bodily fabrication. It's a technical term, but it basically means the in and out breath. Why would the Buddha use a technical term? He wants to alert you to the extent to which you are shaping your experience. The way you breathe shapes the way you feel. The way you talk to yourself will shape the way you feel. The perceptions and feelings you focus on, those will shape your mind. And you want to be sensitive to what you're doing right now, because that gets into the question of values as to what's worth doing. But first you want to see what you are doing. Sometimes you hear it said that breath meditation, especially the way the Buddha teaches, is simply a matter of being with the breath however it's going to be. You just simply watch. You don't assert any influence on it at all. Well, that's impossible. You are influencing the way you breathe. And if you're denying that to yourself, you're not setting yourself up for discernment at all. You're putting up walls. Things go underground and stay underground. So the best way to figure out how you're already fabricating things is to consciously change the way you fabricate things and see which parts of the mind resist. And if the breath is pleasant, energizing, and then calming, it feels really good. That way you get around a lot of the resistance. But still, there are parts of the mind that want to do things their own old way. And you're going to be uncovering a lot of that as you meditate. That's where the system of values comes in. Why are we doing this? The big part of the mind says, well, just, just do it as stress reduction. That'll be okay. Then we'll be able to go back and do the things that we like to do from a sense of well-being. But the whole purpose of the meditation is to change your mind. And the values come in the Four Noble Truths. Suffering is clinging to five aggregates. It's caused by craving. You can put an end to it by putting an end to the craving. And the way you do that is through the Eightfold Path. Those are the Four Truths. 
Those are the basic truths that the Buddha teaches. And they carry duties. They have their shoulds. You should try to comprehend suffering. You should try to abandon the cause. You should try to realize the cessation of suffering, and you do that because you should develop a path. So these are the, the rock-bottom values that we have here as we practice. And other teachings fit in with those values, like the three characteristics of the three perceptions. One of the ways of comprehending your clinging is to see that the things you're clinging to are inconstant and they're stressful. Now, if we didn't have the Four Noble Truths as a framework, there'd be part of the mind that says, well, they may be inconstant but stressful, but if this is the best I've got, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give up holding on to things I'm holding on to. You've got to show me there's something better. That's what the third noble truth is all about. That by letting go of the craving and clinging, there is an ultimate happiness. Where it's just no suffering, no stress at all. Now that changes the, the landscape, the things that you're holding on to. They look pretty paltry in comparison with the possibility of a total end of suffering. Why are you holding on when the end of suffering is possible? So it's a value judgment. When the Buddha talks about the three characteristics, the question there is, in terms of form or feeling, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness, are these things constant or inconstant? Well, they're inconstant. If something is inconstant, is it stressful or useful? Well, the fact that it's inconstant and unreliable means that it's going to involve some stress. And then the conclusion is not, therefore there is no self. The conclusion is, is this worth calling me or mine? And in light of the Third Noble Truth, the answer is no. So the Buddha's map of our reality has the shoulds built into it. If you took those three characteristics on their own, without the context of the Four Noble Truths, they wouldn't have any shoulds. Things are inconstant, stressful. Okay, so what? If we didn't have the possibility of a total end of suffering, as I said, we'd say, well, if they're inconstant and stressful, it's the best I got. I'll hold on. And even though they may not be entirely under my control, I control them at least to some extent. So let's see what I can squeeze out of them for whatever purposes you might have. And from the Buddhist point of view, given the Four Noble Truths. Yes, you can control these things to some extent, but you, what you want to squeeze out of them is the path. Look at the five aggregates. When you're sitting here meditating, form is the sense of the body that you're feeling right now, and the breath as it goes through the body. Feeling is a sense of pleasure you're trying to develop. Perceptions are the mental images you hold in mind of the breath and how you relate to the breath. Fabrication is how you talk to yourself about this as you're doing it. And consciousness is aware of all these things. So there you are, the five aggregates. You're using them, you're squeezing some good out of them by turning them into the path. Why? Because this path does lead to the end of suffering. These are the things you need to develop that will take you to the threshold of that end. So when the Buddha analyzes the mind, it's all for the purpose of putting an end to suffering. So when the Buddha is analyzing suffering, he points out it's coming from within the mind. It's caused by the mind, it's suffered by the mind. So a lot of his teachings about psychology, how to understand the mind, 
where Buddhist psychology differs from Western psychology. It has a strong, what you might call, ethical component. How to understand the mind so that it can become skillful, very skillful. And all the Buddha's analysis of mental functions is pointed to that purpose. This is why when someone was asked one time if the Buddha taught whether the world was eternal or non-eternal, finite or infinite, and went down the whole list of the hot issues of the day. And there was a lay person who was one of the Buddha's students who was answering and said, no, nope, nobody doesn't teach those things. And finally, the person asking the question got frustrated and said, well, your teacher doesn't teach much or anything at all. He's a nihilist. And the lay person says, no, it's not true. What he teaches is skillful and unskillful behavior. It shows the distinction. Skillful behavior should be developed. Unskillful behavior should be abandoned. The lay person then went to see the Buddha and asked him, did I explain what you said correctly? And the Buddha said, yes. Someone once translated the, one of the Apidama books, the one that starts with making the distinction between skillful, unskillful, and neutral mental components, and called the book a manual of Buddhist psychological ethics. This is psychology with an ethical component. And ethics, of course, treated as psychology. But the values are built in. Years back I was asked to write a review of a book on positive psychology, which is the study of how people get happy. And I was taken aback by the fact that the author was saying, well, we're going to study the psychology of happiness without any reference to values, because after all, we're going to be scientific. And so there are going to be people finding happiness and doing unethical things, but we're not going to judge, judge that. So that was the point I focused on. If you want to understand this book from a Buddhist point of view, you have to see that from the Buddhist point of view, karma is rock-bottom principle. The fact that there is skillful, unskillful behavior is a rock-bottom thing. It's one of the Buddhist categorical teachings. Now, from the Buddhist point of view, any kind of happiness that does not take into consideration the well-being of other people is not going to last. So if you truly want to be happy, you have to think about what's skillful and what's not, and skillful in the sense of what's harmless to yourself and other beings. So the Buddhist psychology is the psychology of harmlessness taken to the nth degree, not just in terms of how you treat other people, but how you treat your own mind and how you deal with the mind in a way that ultimately can put an end to suffering all around. Which is why the techniques of the meditation cannot really be separated from the values. We're doing this because of the duties that the Buddha recommends for the Four Noble Truths. In the beginning we do that out of conviction. I was struck a while back by hearing someone say that the Four Noble Truths are not beliefs. Well, they're truths for the Buddha, but they're st still beliefs for us until we've proven them for ourselves. But they're good beliefs, good working hypotheses. Because they make you look at your mind in a way that really compels you to be as skillful as you can. And that's the best kind of psychology there is.